standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. I want to talk a little bit today about perhaps the second most well-known event in Adventist history. The first being 1844. Today I want to talk a little bit about 1888. How many here are familiar with the date 1888 and some of the events surrounding it? I would assume most everyone, if not everyone here, is. We're familiar with some of the issues surrounding that conference in 1888, which took place in Minneapolis. And I want to share some lessons from that which transpired in 1888. I want to go back and give a little background, a little history. Perhaps we can look at it from a different angle, a different perspective. You know, the Lord has lessons for us in our history. We are told that we have nothing to fear for the future, save that we shall forget how the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. And so I want, as it were, to go back and look at the Lord's leading, examine some of his teaching, that we can understand what really brought about 1888. I know there are a lot of theories, a lot of ideas as to what caused 1888, but I want to share with you what the Lord has shared with me in regard to the controversy surrounding that most tumultuous of conferences. And to begin, we're going to take a look at some background. We're going to get a little bit of history at what led up to 1888. And we begin by going clear back to 1854, 10 years after 1844, the most well-known date in Adventist history. In 1854, there was an article published in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. It was published July 18th. It was an article written by one known as Joseph Harvey Wagner. Now, he is the father of who we know as Ellet J. Wagner, or E.J. Wagner, as we know him. Now, this was published in 1854. Keep keep that date in mind. Some 30-plus years before 1888. And it was an article entitled, The Law of God an examination of the testimony of both testaments. And in this article, J.H. Wagner put forth his views regarding the law, specifically in the writings of the Apostle Paul, and specifically in Galatians, relating to the law that is discussed there by the Apostle. And he put forth the idea in this article that the law referred to was none other than the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And unbeknownst to him, that article had quite a stir among many of the Adventists at that time. Now we know that we had not become a people, a denominated people at that point. So they all considered themselves Adventists. And there were a number of those that dissented from Wagner's view on the law in Galatians. And one of them, a gentleman by the name of Stevenson. He wrote an article two years later in the Advent Review and Herald, 1856, refuting his view and and putting forth his own. And it became apparent to all of them at that time that they had differing views. And as they studied and came together, it became apparent to some of them that these views were irreconcilable. These two views could not be harmonized, could not be reconciled. And so they came to an understanding they determined that no more would be published on the matter in their periodicals. They would not make it known to the public that they dissented on this. They would put forth the appearance of harmony. Even though there were minor issues that they differed on, they would not present those issues to the public as though that there were some great variance or difference among them. So they decided to keep it quiet, continue to study, Hopefully they could come together in harmony, but they decided they were not going to publish their divergent and different views so as to create division, further division. 
This was decided. And in that year, shortly thereafter, uh, Sister White was given a vision where she was shown that Wagner's view was not correct. And she told Wagner this. And so Wagner determined that he would never publish anything in any of the Advent Review or any of the Advent periodicals regarding the subject matter. And the others followed his suit. And they, they believed that that which had been given by Sister White was inspired and was the counsel to be followed by all, not just J.H. Wagner. And so a little bit of the background. Here you can see just a few dates. Now this was just three years after Wagner had joined, had accepted the Advent Doctrine. 1851 was when he joined the movement. And we saw the article published in 1854. One year later, or just under a year later, his son, E.J. Wagner, was born. So this was before the birth of E.J. Wagner. And in 1878, Wagner, together with his wife and other children, moved to California, where he became the editor and the chief editor and the one who ran the periodical that became known as the Signs of the Times. From 1878 to 1886, he was the chief and pretty much sole editor of the Signs of the Times. Coming forward a number of years, in 1883, his son, E.J. Wagner, joined him at the Signs of the Times and became co-editor together with his father, and he held that position until 1891. Two years, or just under two years later, he was joined by who would, one who had become his friend, whom he met in 1884. His name was Alonzo T. Jones. He also became editor at the Signs of the Times in 1885 and held the position for four years until 1889. Now, you may be wondering, what does all this have to do with the issue? Well, E.J. shared his father's views on the law in Galatians. And they had both kind of been taken under the wing of J.H. Wagner while in California, and both had adopted his views of the law in Galatians. But they, unlike the father, did not have the experience that the pioneers had gone through in divergent opinions. And so these two men, fervent, believing what they had been studying regarding the the gospel and the law in Galatians began to publish their views and began to present it in the college in California to the young ministerial students. They began to present these views regarding the law in Galatians. This began around 1885, 1886. And in 1886, E.J. Wagner began to publish, publish a series of articles throughout that year on the law and its relation to the gospel and certain other areas. At the same time, Jones began to publish his views on the Ten Horns of Daniel and Revelation, both divergent views from what were held by the pioneers. And there was a response. And I want to quote here just an excerpt from J. H. Wagner's article of 1854, just so we can get an idea of what he was presenting. He says, quote, We conclude that the same law is spoken of in Galatians and Romans, that the word law, whenever it is used in the epistle of James or those to the Galatians and Romans, has reference to the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, except when directly qualified, end quote. So here is his view in summary, in short, he believed that whenever the law was referred to unqualified in the writings of the New Testament, that it referred to the moral law, not what they had termed the ceremonial or typical law. He believed that it was the moral law, and this was the area of controversy. And when it became known to the leaders in the conference that these views were now being promulgated to the ministerial students, and published in the leading, or one of the leading periodicals of the movement, Seventh-day Adventist movement, there was trouble. And in 1886, 
who, he who was the president of the General Conference, George I. Butler, wrote a letter to Sister White expressing his concerns over what he had learned about being published in the periodical. You can find it in Manuscripts and Memories of Minneapolis, page 18, paragraph 4. I'm going to quote from that paragraph. In writing to Sister White, he states his concerns thus. He says, I am positive that by far the largest number of our people and of our ministers hold the view that the, quote, added law, added because of the transgression of the moral law, is the typical remedial system pointing to Christ. And that law, which is the main subject of discussion by the apostle in Galatians, is the ceremonial law. He continues, Elder J. H. Wagner was always much opposed to this view, and I judge the young brethren in the office share his sentiments. But some of us have felt we ought to keep rather quiet on this subject, seeing there was not unanimity of opinion on it by all our leading brethren. But when we learn that the opposite view held by the minority is being vigorously pushed in one of our colleges among our Bible students and published to the world in the signs, I confess, it does not please me very well. End quote. And you could imagine that here was this, as they understood it, a minority view, a view held by a minority, which they had all agreed to keep silent, was now published to the world. What were they to do? Was an answer to be given, or was the world to understand that this was our view? You see the conundrum? A box had now been opened that could not be shut. I don't know if you are familiar with the old myth of Pandora's box that once opened it could not be shut and it contained all the calamities and chaos that have been exhibited in this world. Well, we have a similar instance here. After not getting a, a reply from Sister White, he wrote again to her on August 23rd, sharing his concerns. And in this letter, he states it again. He says, I dislike to recur to this subject again. I have kept very quiet myself and only talked with a few leading brethren about it, or those who have asked my opinion. The matter was all out through the public print before I dreamed what was coming, and I could not stop it then if I had tried. Whatever may be considered concerning the positions taken, the making of our colleges, Sabbath school lessons, and pioneer papers, the vehicle for presenting theological views not believed by two-thirds or three-fourths of the denomination, seems to me very wrong. And I think if we were in his position, we would have seen it the same. We all would have had a similar view of what had transpired. And the reason he had not had a response was because Sister White immediately sent a letter to Brethren Wagner and Jones, admonishing for what they had done. But we do not know whether that letter ever arrived because no response was sent back to her from them. But I want to share with you a letter that she sent shortly afterward, after this issue had been boiling for some time. She again wrote to these two young men in California, and I want to share with you some of this letter. Now, what I'm going to be sharing with you was written in a personal, private letter. It has since been published by the denomination. And I believe, by God, that we might understand the real nature, what was at least one of the major undercurrents that brought about the trouble in 1888 and why the great message of Christ and his righteousness was resisted by so many. It might seem a mystery, but understanding the facts that I presented so far, it should not be a mystery any longer. And I'm going to share with you some excerpts from this letter. It's a long letter. And what I'm going to share with you is what inspiration has to say regarding the actions taken by these two young men and by others and what genuinely needed to be done. Not only did she present the problem, but she presents the solution to these young men. And I want to share with you both of them 
that we might gain lessons from Minneapolis. Lessons that will help us as we continue in this movement. For we are called back to that same platform, called back to that same spirit of Philadelphia that moved those men in the early years of our movement. God wants us to learn from the mistakes that were made, that we make not those same mistakes, that we cause not unnecessary division within us. And make no mistake, all the things, and I say all of the things, that have resulted from 1888 on stemmed from these things that I shared with you today. They were the result of it. Now, there were other undercurrents that came in and played along with it, but this was the great undercurrent that led to the resistance of the message and so much division and that opened the door for other heresies to come in and be printed in our presses and promulgated in our schools and sanitariums. The letter was written February 18th, 1887. After having not received a response for a number of months, she finally wrote to them. Now, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but portions, just so we can understand these lessons. She begins, this is not the beginning of the letter, but in this paragraph, she begins by saying, If you, my brethren, speaking to Wagner and Jones, if you, my brethren, had the experience that my husband and myself have had in regard to these known differences being published in articles in our papers, you would never have pursued the course you have. Either in your ideas advanced before our students at the college, neither would it have appeared in the signs. Especially at this time should everything like differences be repressed. Even if you are fully convict, convinced that your ideas of doctrines are sound, you do not show wisdom that that difference should be made apparent. Do you understand what she's saying? Are you seeing the issue? Do we all agree on everything? No. no. We don't all agree, do we? But we do not well when we make that difference known to the world. We show division. We show variance. We show not love, but we show variance and hatred. We show arrogance and pride to the world. And it sows division. It causes those not only within the church, but those surrounding it to draw sides and take sides and divide. It is one of the wiles of the devil. And Sister White addresses it in kind, yet clear tones to these young men. She continues, I have no hesitancy in saying you have made a mistake here. You have departed from the positive directions God has given me upon this, excuse me, God has given upon this matter. And only harm will be the result. This is not in God's order. You have now set the example for others to do as you have done. Now she explains what that is. She says, To feel at liberty to put in their various ideas and theories and bring them before the public. Once one man has done it, everyone else can do it. They open the door for public debate on areas that we did not all see eye to eye on. They had opened Pandora's box. And God recognized this and sent a rebuke to these two young men, a rebuke that should resound and re-echo down to our day. You want to know why there's so much division in the church today and in this movement, the Truth About God movement? I'll tell you why. It's what I'm sharing with you today. These very same things have been done. Men have failed to learn the lesson from Minneapolis. Not understanding the nature of the human heart. The fierce passions that arise when these things happen. It does not result in good. 
even though we may feel and believe that we are 100% right and justified in our belief, we ought not to present that belief if it is not in accordance with the brethren. If we know that there is a difference of opinion on this, it only creates division and strife, debate and variance. It does not draw together. It draws apart. And this was the lesson that these men learned in the early years of the movement. For the first 50 years, they had to deal with this time and time again. And those men learned. But you see, sadly, the younger generation did not have that experience. They had the doctrines, yes. They had the theories, yes. But they lacked some of that experience that taught them love for the brethren, love for the thoughts and opinions of their fellow men and Christians. And when we present views that are at variance, we show that we have no respect for their opinion, no consideration for their feelings. And be assured, feelings get involved in these things. We might say, yes, I'm upset and I'm righteously indignant, but there are feelings nonetheless that are stirred up by these type of things. And Satan uses them to this fullest. And he used them on both sides. Both sides. Mistakes were made. Words were said that should never have been said. Articles were written that should never have been written. She continues. There are those who do not go deep, who are not Bible students, who will take positions decidedly for or against, grasping at apparent evidence, yet it may not be truth. And to take differences into our conferences, where the differences become widespread, thus sending forth all through the fields various ideas, one in opposition to the other, is not God's plan, but at once raises questionings, doubts, whether we have the truth, whether, after all, we are not mistaken and in error. It is no small matter for you to come out in the signs as you have done. And God has plainly revealed that such things should not be done. We must keep before the world a united front. Satan will triumph to see differences among Seventh-day Adventists. Satan will do what? When he sees these differences, he triumphs. He rejoices. I did see years ago that Elder, that is J.H. Wagner's views, were not correct and read to him matter which I had written. The matter does not lie clear and distinct in my mind yet. I cannot grasp the matter, and for this reason I am fully convinced that presenting it has been not only untimely, but deleterious. The Reformation was greatly retarded by making prominent differences on some points of faith, and each party holding tenaciously to those things where they differed. We shall see eye to eye ere long, but to become firm and consider it your duty to present your views in decided opposition to the faith or truth as it has been taught by us as a people is a mistake and will result in harm and only harm, as in the days of Martin Luther. Begin to draw apart and feel at liberty to express your ideas without reference to the views of your brethren, and a state of things will be introduced that you do not dream of. You see, brethren, God sees the end from the beginning. He knows what will result in these things. And she had experience in this, having experienced what had transpired in the first 30 years of the movement. She knew well what would be the result of these things. Her, her husband, and many others had experienced what it cost. But you see, these young men didn't. And so God in love wrote to them, helping them see the mistake that they had made in hopes that it could be corrected. She continues, My husband had some ideas on some points differing from the views taken by his brethren. I was shown. Now you know what she means when she says I was shown. That this is not opinion. That this is a revelation from God. She says, I was shown that however true his views were, God did not call for him to put them in front before his brethren and create differences of ideas. While he might hold these views subordinate himself, once they are made public, minds would seize upon them 
And just because others believed differently would make these differences the whole burden of the message and get up contention and variance. You see what happens? One will accept this doctrine, one will accept this doctrine, and this doctrine will become the gospel. These doctrines will become the gospel, the truth, the heart and soul of the message, when in fact they're not. They're just distractions that Satan uses to divide us. Speculative ideas should not be agitated. What kind of ideas? Speculative. Those that are not clear, that do not have a thus saith the Lord, that require our interpretation, adding words or taking away words to come to that conclusion. Those type of ideas, she says, should not be agitated. Whether we're correct or incorrect in our views, they should not be agitated. They should remain private until further study by many of the brethren, or all of the brethren if possible, until we can come to agreement and harmony on these things. And if we can't, then it should remain silent. We should remain silent upon these issues. She continues, For there are peculiar minds that love to get some point that others do not accept, and argue and attract everything to that one point, urging that point, magnifying that point, when it is really a matter which is not of vital importance and will be understood differently, of course, by different minds. Twice I have been shown that everything of a character to cause our brethren to be diverted from the very points now essential for this time should be kept in the background. Everything apart from the messages that God has given to us explicitly, the three angels' messages, the teaching of the sanctuary, the dual atonement, the Sabbath, the non-immortality of the soul. All these doctrines that God has given to us are to be the prominent features of our message that is to be taken to the world. Amen. And all those that are, are not a part of that, whether they're right or wrong, do not have a place in the message we're to take to the world or even to our brethren. They should remain quiet and in the background until further study and further light is given on these things. Christ did not reveal many things that were truth because it would create a difference of opinion and get up disputations. But young men who have not passed through this experience we have had would as soon have a brush as not. Nothing would suit them better than a sharp discussion. There must be decided efforts to handle publishing with pen and voice these things that will reveal only harmony. We are one in faith and in the fundamental truths of God's word. And one object must be kept in view constantly. That is, harmony and cooperation must be maintained without compromising one principle of truth. And while constantly digging for the truth as for hidden treasure, be careful how you open up new and conflicting opinions. We have a worldwide message. The commandments of God and the testimonies of Jesus Christ are the burden of our work. To have unity and love for one another is the great work now to be carried on. There is danger of our ministers dwelling too much on doctrines, preaching altogether too many discourses on argumentative subjects when their own soul needs practical godliness. There has been a door thrown open for variance and strife and contention and differences which none of you can see but God. His eye traces the beginning to the end, and the magnitude of mischief God alone knows. The bitterness, the wrath, the resentment, the jealousies, the heart burnings provoked by controversies of both sides of the question causes the loss of many souls. I know that Satan's work will be to set brethren at variance, were it not that I know that the captain of our salvation stands at the helm to guide the gospel ship into the harbor, I should say, let me rest in the grave. Truths connected with the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven will be talked of, written upon, more than now. There is to be closed every door that will lead to points of difference and debate among brethren. If the old man was purged from every heart, 
then there would be greater safety in discussion. But now the people need something of a different character. There is altogether too little of the love of Christ in the hearts of those who claim to believe the truth. While all their hopes are centered in Jesus Christ, while His Spirit pervades the soul, then there will be unity, although every idea may not be exactly the same on all points. The Bible is but yet dimly understood. A lifelong prayerful study of its sacred revealings will leave still much unexplained. It is the deep movings of the Spirit of God that is needed to operate upon the heart, to mold character, to open the communication between God and the soul before the deep truths will be unraveled. Man has to learn himself before God can do great things for him. Amen. The little knowledge imparted might be a hundredfold greater if the mind and character were balanced by the holy enlightenment of the Spirit of God. Altogether, too little meekness and humility are brought into the work of searching for the truth as for hidden treasures. And if the truth were taught as it is in Jesus, there would be a hundredfold greater power, and it would be a converting power upon human hearts. But everything is so mingled with self that the wisdom from above cannot be imparted. Now those are just excerpts from the letter. But in it, the Lord, I believe, presents through Sister White the issue, the real heart that was at issue in this controversy that caused the deep feelings of resentment, the striving against the message of truth that God gave to Jones and Wagner. God gave them a most precious message to turn the minds of the people back to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might be placed in his rightful position. But hearts were led to resist that message because of what these men had done. All their struggles, all their heart burnings, all the, the bitterness, all the passion was the result of one, what we might consider, little mistake. But it opened up a box that could not be shut, a door that could not be shut. And it has been repeated time and time and time again because we have failed to learn from our history. And because, because of this, we find repeated the words of the wise man in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to share them with you. It's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, who was king in Jerusalem, Solomon, wrote, All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Why is our history repeated? Because there is no remembrance of former things. We forget to learn the lessons from our past, and so we repeat them time and time again. We scar again the hands that bled for us and the side that bled for us by causing division, hatred, and strife among God's people, those whom he shed his precious blood to save, we turn away because we fail to learn of our lessons. And I know it's a hard saying, but it's true. God wants us to learn. He is not willing that any should perish. And so he's recorded both on the pages of his holy book and on the pages of our history these lessons for us to learn that we might understand and avoid the pitfalls 
that caused all the division and strife. Not only in 1888, but from that time to our present time. Today is the day. It's not too late for us to learn our lesson. It's never too late for repentance. I myself have been guilty of this. But God has led me to see the danger of it, to see the magnitude of it. And I want to see and understand it greater. I want to see it as God sees it. I want to see that sin in all its deformity as he sees it, that it might become as repulsive to me as it is to him, that I would rather be willing to swallow my pride, swallow my opinions, than to suffer the loss of one of my brethren because of my foolish speech or because I have made an issue of something that ought not to be made an issue. May the Lord God give us wisdom. I want to conclude with a few thoughts from the Word of God. Some things that God has written to help us understand the nature of these issues that we looked at in Minneapolis. Now, this is just one. I see it as the heart, but there were other issues at play, as I mentioned. I want us to turn first and look at some of the words that the Apostle Paul said to, to the Romans in chapter 12 and verse 3. Here the Apostle Paul writes, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. You see, Satan has been so successful in leading us to think that we're such a great thing, that our opinions are so, such great things. But God would admonish us to know that if we think of ourselves more highly than we ought, we have a lesson to learn. We need to humble ourselves and realize that God has given to every man the measure of faith. God has not given truth exclusive to one man. It belongs to all of us. It is public domain. God has given us the truth. And what the Lord saith is truth. And no man can refute it. And we ought to hold to that and stand firm for that. But all of my opinion that is not in harmony with this needs to be put aside, needs to be set aside. The second thing I want to share is taken from the epistle to the Philippians, chapter 2. We're going to read verses 3 and 4. For some of you, it will be a reiteration. But it never hurts. Amen? Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. There the apostle writes, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And I might add to it, the first words of verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need to learn that consideration, that brotherly kindness and thoughtfulness toward the feelings and opinions of our brethren. How they feel. And how would they feel were we to do this or that? Because that's how God deals with us. And note... Nothing is to be done through strife or vainglory. That is the exaltation of self or to cause division. God wants everything to be done to bring us into harmony. A oneness not only of doctrine, but a oneness of mind, a oneness of spirit. That we can move together with one step as a mighty army. That the sound of our march will cause tremors to the world and will cause those who are the enemy of the gospel to tremble before the banner of him who will go before us, the Lord of hosts. If we will allow his spirit to unite us, we will move as an army unconquerable. And Christ will give us the victory. This conflict will come to an end, and the controversy will cease, 
But God is waiting on us. He's waiting for His own character to be revealed and manifested in His people. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3. We read again. The Apostle Paul admonishing young Timothy. He says, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, that they teach no other doctrine. You see, this was going on even in the days of the Apostle Paul. And Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus to be an influence for good, to encourage the brethren, not to sow seeds of strife, not to teach other than that which the apostles had taught, because it would lead to division. And we see the results of it. If you go back and read the history in the book of Acts, you see what failure to do these things led to, the great controversies. And finally, 2 Peter our last text, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. There the Apostle Peter writes, excuse me, as also in all his epistles, speaking in, the, in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Here the Apostle Peter is referring to the Apostle Paul, in his writings. He was aware, and all of the brethren were aware, that many of the things that the Apostle Paul wrote were hard things, not easy to be understood, which many who were unlearned and unstable rested to their own destruction. They twisted them to fit their own opinions, their own ideas, and they began to promulgate these, and it led to their own destruction. But I would add not only to theirs, but to all them that heard them. It was one of the great causes of strife and contention among the Christian church in the early days. You see, Paul wrote many things, and some of them are hard. They take time to understand. And sometimes we're too quick to come to an opinion, too quick to come to an understanding. We we kind of jump to conclusions about certain things before we have laid the matter in thoroughness before us, before we've searched it out exhaustively to understand what God has to say on this matter. Sometimes we jump to these things. And in so doing, we cause division. And we put our opinions out there before we, we really understand what we're, what we're preaching, what we're presenting. And later, when, it comes to sh- when our, our opinion is shown to be wrong, by that time, pride has set in. So many have heard it and jumped on our bandwagon that now Satan pulls the string of pride. Well, you can't retract your opinion now. It would be so humiliating. You'd have to acknowledge to all these people that you're wrong. You see how the devil works? He leads us into these rash decisions, knowing what the result will be. But God wants us to learn a lesson. God wants us to learn patience carefulness, thoughtfulness in how we deal in presenting our doctrines to the world and how we present them to our brethren as well. And that is my hope and prayer for us today, that the lessons that are contained in the Bible and we find in the history of our Advent movement and even in the history of the Protestant Reformation and going back to the history of the early church, may God give us that heavenly Isaph, that our eyes may be anointed to see that if we have done these things, we have been guilty of these things, that we might fully repent, change our heart, change our mind in regard to these things. We can do nothing for the past, for what our mistakes have caused, but we can redeem the time. We can correct our mistakes as much as, in our, as, it, as it is in our power. And allow God to do the rest of what we cannot do. As long as we are willing to repent and change, God will forgive. And God will work all things together for our good. It doesn't say that all things will be good. 
but that all things will be worked together for our good. That is the promise we have. But it comes at a cost. It comes at the cost of self. A re-examination of self and our ideas. May the Lord give us a spirit of love for one another. A spirit of love for Him and His truth. And if that's your desire, then I want to invite you to kneel together with me in a word of prayer as we close. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I thank thee for giving us today thy daily bread. I thank thee for the lessons that thou hast left on record for us, that we might be admonished, that we might be corrected and also encouraged. Father, we know that those whom thou dost love, thou dost chasten and rebuke. Help us to be zealous, therefore, and repent, that if any of us have been guilty of this, as I know I myself have, I pray, Father, give me the spirit of repentance. Give me a change of heart and a change of mind toward my views and toward the views of my brethren. Give me a love for thee and a love for them. Place in my heart, Father, that love for souls that coursed through the veins of my Lord and Savior Jesus. And I pray, Father, bless our ears that they may hear. Bless our eyes that they may see and our hearts that they may understand. For this is my prayer. In the precious name of thy Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. May the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions